the highest throne welcomed by a melody anthem I have always known a song that's always been in me all glory and honor dominion and power to you
Good morning, Emmanuel Aurelia. We are really glad that you're here with us this morning. We are concluding our sermon series this morning in Genesis chapter 11. Pastor Dave is speaking on pride this morning. Um, if you are sitting here this morning and you have your kids with you, just a quick reminder, this is a family service. If you just gave your spouse that look of, oh no, we had no idea or we forgot, don't worry, we have activity packets out in the foyer for you, for your kids. There's crayons, there's markers, anything you could need for them, they're out in the foyer. We also have up in our balcony area, there's a section with um, some couches, a couple toys, and a TV that is streaming the service. So if you need to step out with your kids for a little bit, that's totally fine. Um, there's that area upstairs if you want to keep watching the service. Um, so might be a little loud this morning in here with all our wonderful kids in here, but um, it's going to be a great service. If you're new here this morning, we would love to connect with you. If this is your first time, maybe your second or third time, and you haven't connected too well, um, we'd love if you'd use one of our connection cards and hand it in at our welcome uh, desk out front in our foyer. If you've been here a while and you see a new face that maybe you haven't seen before, make sure to greet that person, ask them um, if they're new, um, if they need help getting connected, um, and let's just make everyone feel as welcome as we can this morning. Um, we have just a couple announcements for this morning, a few things coming up in our church. Uh, the first one is our Work B, which is happening this Saturday, uh, May 27th at 8 a.m., um, we're meeting at the church. There's just a few small projects outdoors and indoors to help kind of spruce up our building after that super long winter. Um, I thought it was long. I thought it was too cold. So we're super excited that the warm weather's here, and we just want to get our building ready for that. So 8 a.m. this Saturday, um, I was told Russ is doing an all-you-can-eat pancake breakfast. He's going to be flipping pancakes all morning for whoever comes. Is that, yeah, okay, perfect. Uh, no, there will be coffee and there is muffins, um, but we won't make Russ make a million pancakes. Um, so please come on out. It's also a great opportunity to come out and maybe meet some people that you haven't met in our church and work alongside them and just have a good morning um, being able to serve together. Uh, June 4th, ladies, these last two announcements are for us. So June 4th, ladies, um, the Forever Young group in our church, the R55 plus, are hosting a luncheon for all the women in our church. The men have graciously offered to serve us, um, and we are going to come. It's right after service in the community room, and this is an amazing opportunity for us women to get to connect um, intergenerationally with each other. I know for myself on Sunday mornings with my three little ones, it's hard to have more than a one-minute conversation with people. So this is a great opportunity for us to be able to um, have a meal together, be able to chat with one another and get to know each other, and hopefully this will lead to some great discipleship opportunities as well for us and I was told Susan that there's prizes there's prizes so free meal kid free prizes it's gonna be a great time so make sure you mark your calendars for that that's um, June 4th so in two Sundays just meeting in the community room after um, husbands mark your calendars as well for that because your wives aren't coming home um, you're on lunch duty so McDonald's on Memorial has a play place great idea if you want to do that. Um, there's safety in numbers. Maybe a couple of you go. Uh, <laughs> but that's on June 4th. Um, on June 5th, ladies, so the Monday right after that, at 7 p.m., we have a wedding shower for Sarah Best, one of our young adults here, and her wonderful fiancé. And I saw them up in the balcony. Sarah, why don't you give a wave in case nobody, if somebody doesn't know who you are. Sarah and Ben are getting married this summer, and we are so excited for them. And we just want to really love on them and show them our support as they venture into this new chapter of their lives. So that's 7 p.m. on June 5th, ladies. Um, before I turn it over, actually, to Tyler, um, if you are wanting to worship through tithing, I just want to do a quick reminder. We have our joy boxes at the back of the auditorium. We also have the opportunity to give online if you would prefer to do that. Um, take a minute, stand up, greet one another, say hello. If there's a face you don't know, introduce yourself, and then Tyler will start in a minute.
Yeah, you can stay standing. You can stay standing. We're going to sing together. We, uh, we learned this song last week. This song is called This Is Our God. It just declares this is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. He pulled us out of the pit. He rescued us from the grave. And uh, I'm going to need your help singing this morning. My voice is a little bit disappearing on me. So if I stop singing, you just keep going, okay, church? But uh, yeah, we're going we're gonna, to yeah, follow Dave. Dave's going to sing if I stop singing. But uh, yeah, let's worship together.
year. He's working in our midst. He's moving in power. Sing this out.
Jesus is it out to our way maker, miracle worker, promise keep light. statement that I think it's easy for us just to sing that and not really even plumb the depths of that, that no matter what life throws at us, that he can hold us fast. No matter how good things look or no matter how bad things look, it's, it's he that holds us fast. And no matter how many ways that Satan comes against us and he attacks us, whether it be physically, emotionally, relationally, 
culture, you name it. But no matter what's going on around us, no matter how much it looks like things are falling apart, that we worship a God who not only cares, but is capable of holding us fast no matter what. What a profound truth. When you're thinking that, how that just needs to drive us to fall on our knees before him and just simply say this, because of who you are, because of what you are and what you can do, we trust you. Because we are way better in your hands than we'll ever be in our own. What do you say? We have a number of things we need to take to the Lord in prayer. I'm not going to list them off at this point. What do you just say? We bow our heads and we pray and we'll take them to the one who holds us fast and can address every need. Dear God and Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we come before you this morning, not just as a, as a congregation, but we come before you as a family and as a body. Uh, Lord, brothers and sisters together, that we come together to worship you with our identity firmly rooted in you because of who you are. And Lord, I thank you for that. I thank you for the relationships that that affords us, for the care that that affords us as well. But Lord, we come before you knowing that really in you is the source of everything that we need. And Lord, in particular this morning, I'm, I'm aware that there's, there's folks that are going through a lot. Lord, we think of John McIntosh, who this week uh, went through open heart surgery. And Lord, my understanding here this morning is that he, he's recovering well. But Lord, he needs you. He needs your healing hand. His, his family needs the assurances that you can give. He needs the doctors to be at their very best. But Lord, even as we have sung this morning, we know that his hope is ultimately in you who holds him fast and guides and directs through all of this. And Lord, I pray that he would have both physical comfort but great emotional and spiritual comfort in knowing that this morning. Lord, we also want to lift up to you those families that we know, and there are several among us who have had a really tough couple of weeks. And Lord, I, I can't go through all of those. I, I wouldn't even be able to hit on all the needs, even if I tried. But Lord, there isn't a single one of those circumstances. There isn't a single one of those marriages, a single one of those families that you are not intimately aware of every, every struggle that they're going through right now. And Lord, you are right there in the midst of it. And I pray that they would know that. I pray that they would feel your presence in your hand there. And in that, even when perhaps they feel comfort in nothing else, Lord, I pray that they would feel comfort in you. I pray that you would meet them in that need. I pray that you would guide and direct those who are around us to come alongside as well. And even if we can't alleviate that, Lord, we know that you can. And so we ask that you would minister to them this morning. Lord, we think about the Aurelia Pregnancy Resource Center as we're in the midst of the, the fundraiser drive for them right now. And Lord, we're, we're doing the things that we can do to raise funds for that. We recognize that's not just some charity, but that's, that's lives that are on the line. And that that ministry reaches out and it gives young moms and, and expected mothers an option when they may feel like there is no other option. And it's not just a matter of a better life. It's a matter of life or death for a child. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would be at work, not just in this church, not just in our hearts, but in every other organization that's raising funds. And maybe those that don't even know that that's what you're calling them to do this week. But, Lord, I pray that you would move, that people would reach out, and that that ministry would be funded and driven forward. Because it's too important for us to miss. And Lord, also as a staff, we, we come for you. And as a church, Lord, as we, as we continue on with the ministry that's here, and we're, we're searching for the right person for this position of the kids' community director. And Lord, we just pray that you would guide and direct in that process as well. And Lord, that that would just be a real uh, a blessing to the church and to the staff. And Lord, that we would see a ministry that is thriving, continue to move forward and, and do even greater things. And we look forward to that person, but Lord, we trust you in that search. And Lord, as Davis is preparing to come and share the message this morning, and Lord, I pray that in this moment, we would, our hearts would be tender to you. Your, your word calls us, and even in these moments we talk over and over about, you will hold me fast. And Lord, the, the question is never whether or not you will, never whether you have the capacity, it's whether we'll trust you. And sometimes we're in such a battle and we're fighting back and forth and, and we seem to trust our own instincts. We seem to trust our own desires. We believe that our happiness is best in our hands than it is in yours. I pray that you would give us the humility 
to trust you, that those words that you hold us fast wouldn't just be a platitude, but would be a reality and a rallying cry for those of us who trust you every day. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy long weekend to each one of you. Happy cold long weekend to each one of you. But the sun is out. That's good. The sun is out. Um, hey, if you're a kid that's normally downstairs in kids' community, put up your hand and just give me a wave this morning because we are so grateful that you are nice. Audrey, and, and, and yes, yes. Um, and give, me a, give me a wave. If you're normally in kids' community, give me a wave. We are so glad that you're with us. If you are looking for a worksheet, there are worksheets at the back. If you haven't grabbed one, you can grab one at the back and you can uh, kind of work through that worksheet as, as I'm speaking up here. Uh, before we get going into the message this morning, just a few things. This is going to wrap up our Genesis 1 to 11 series this morning. Um, next week, we have a Mission Sunday, and we have a commissioning of Julianne Richardson, so we're excited for that. So come back uh, next week for our Mission Sunday. The week after that, June the 4th, you need to be here. So um, we have, I, I think there's around nine people being baptized on June the 4th, so you need to be here. Uh, we're going to have the tank on the front of the stage here. Yes, that is worthy of some, some applause, but we are going to have the tank here, and we have nine people, I believe, nine people There could be even more. If you're interested in being baptized, come and talk to me or Russ. We'd love to get you baptized on, on that Sunday. But uh, June the 4th, come back for that. And then the next two Sundays after that, we have a new series, just a two-week series that we've called Got Questions. And we want to be able to answer your questions up here on a panel style kind of a Sunday. We got Vic Router going to host that those Sundays for us and ask uh, uh, myself, Russ, and Tyler, put us on the hot seat and ask us some hard questions questions up here on, on the stage. So if you have questions that have been burning in your mind over the last however many years, we would love to get them from you. And we would love to, to, to attempt to be able to answer those questions um, and on those two weeks um, that we do that, that mini-series called Got Questions. Well, if you got your Bible, grab them. Turn them on, whatever you want to do with them, but turn to Genesis chapter 11. This is the last Sunday in this uh, Genesis series. Genesis chapter 11, and we are going to be looking at Genesis 11 verses 1 to 9 this morning. And we've come to a topic this morning. We've come this morning to a, a talk that is about a silent killer. It has taken out politicians, it has taken out business leaders, it has taken out sports personalities, it's even taken out fathers, mothers, and children alike, it has even taken out great men and women of the faith. C.S. Lewis, in talking about this topic that we're going to look at this morning, said that this silent killer is the greatest sin. The essential vice, the utmost evil, unchastity, anger, greed, drunkenness, and all of that are mere flea bites in comparison to this silent killer. This one leads to every other sin. Do you know what this sin is? Do you know what we're going to be talking about this morning? It is the silent killer of pride. Pride. Thomas Aquinas said that pride is the beginning of all sin. It is the most grievous because it is the most difficult to avoid. And pride is more subtle than any other sin. 
it even taints our good deeds and it even taints our no deeds. Gordon Hall was a 32 year old, it was 32 years old when he became a multi, 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 multi millionaire. He was a real estate developer and a health club entrepreneur in the United States. He owned a 55,000 square foot mansion in Paradise Valley, Arizona. He was in many ways on top of the world. No one could stop him. No one could reach him. In fact, he was so untouchable in his eyes that he started believing that he was God himself. He even once said these words to reporters. He said, I believe that I am God. That is why I believe that I can do anything. My genetic makeup is God-like. There is a God who can create worlds and heavens. However, I believe I can do so much more than that. However, in 1999, this great Gordon Hall traded his 52,000 square foot mansion for a six by eight foot prison cell. Although he thought he was God and God-like, he was convicted for conducting a 93 million tax scam and will spend the rest of his life in prison. Let me ask you, what was it? What was it that brought this man down? And the answer, pride. He thought he was untouchable. He thought he could do anything. He thought that he was God. Now, we can hear a story like that. We can hear a name like that. And we can think, that would never be me. I would never allow pride to rule my life like that. I would never, you know, become that proud like that man. However, we better watch out because pride has this insatiable desire. Pride has this insatiable ability to suck us in. Let me show you 15 ways that pride sucks us in and manifests itself in our life, and see if it's in your life. You ready? 15 ways that pride can manifest itself in our life. When you assume that you already know everything, and you don't need to learn anything else, it's pride. When you are overconfident, and you don't don't need anyone else or anything else in your life, it's pride. When you can't stand to ask for help or or unwilling to ask for help, do you know what it is? It's pride. When you're always needing to teach someone else the right way or your way, you know what it is? It's pride. When you always are talking about yourself, it's pride. When you're always thinking that you are better or could do better than the other person, it's pride. When you disregard advice or when you are unwilling to listen to others, it's pride. When you are constantly critical of other people and you are never wrong, it's pride. If you're constantly needing attention or affirmation from other people, it's pride. If you're unable or unwilling to receive constructive criticism, it's pride. When you're obsessed with your physical appearance, it's pride. When you're unwilling to submit to authority, it's pride. When you ignore people, when they try to talk to you because you don't have time for them, or because you don't really care what they have to say, or you're not interested, guess what it is? It's pride. When you justify your sin, it's pride. When you feel like you need to name drop, it's pride. Pride 
It's all around us, and it's even living at times in our own very hearts. And if we're not careful, it will destroy our very lives. And this morning, we've come to a great moment in all of human history. And that great moment is the story of the Tower of Babel. And it's a story that speaks to the pride of humanity, and it's found here in Genesis chapter 11. And inside this story, we learn three lessons. Are you ready for them? We learn what pride looks like through humanity's heart. We also learn what pride looks like through heaven's eyes. And we also learn here in this story how God lovingly deals with the pride in our life. You ready for it? Here's what it says, verse 1. Now the whole world had come, now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and uh, settled there. They said to each other, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we can make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, if as, oh, as one people speak in the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan will do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. For the Lord scattered them from there all over the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it's called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. One of the first things that we learn from this story, from this text, is what pride looks like through humanity's heart. Inside of this story, we find four ways that pride reveals itself. You ready for those four ways? The first way that we see pride manifesting itself in all of humanity here is in verse 2. It says, as people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. Moses is trying to get our attention here in this text. He's wanting us to see something here. He is using a word picture to point out something about humanity's pride. And the word picture is found in the phrase, as the people moved eastward. Did you know that the direction of east is used throughout Genesis to describe the act of moving away from God? In other words, it signifies a drift from God. When Adam and Eve were removed from the garden, they were sent towards the east. When Cain was sent out after he murdered his brother, he was sent away to the east of the garden. When Abraham and Lot were choosing where they were going to settle, Lot chose poorly and chose to go to the east to Sodom and Gomorrah. In other words, when people move east, it signifies that there is this emotional and spiritual drift away from God that is happening in the heart of that person. And isn't that what pride does? right? It takes our eyes and our hearts and our souls off of God, and it places it on ourselves, and we begin to drift away. We become self-absorbed. We become self-interested. We become self-loved. We become self-conceited, self-opinionated, self-declared, self-praised, self 
righteous, self-seeking, self-fulfilling, self-indulgent, and ultimately we become self-sufficient. I don't need God. I can do it all on my own. Paul David Tripp, an author and pastor, said this, pride narrows our personal field of concern down to the claustrophobic confines of my wants, my needs, my feelings, my desires. Pride inserts me into the center of my universe. Pride makes it all about me. I want to eat chocolate when I want to eat chocolate. I want to drive on roads where nobody else is driving so that I will not be bothered by traffic or people or traffic jams. I want a wife who will serve me that will say, yes, dear, whatever you say. And she is after my wants and my needs and my desires. I want two kids who listen to me, who will go to bed when I ask them to, to be quiet when I say be silent, to not tease each other and not so that I don't have to listen to their fighting. I want children who will obey me. Why? Because I am smart, I am wise, and they should submit to me, right? I want, I want, I want, I want, I want, I want, is what Paul David Tripp says. You see, pride causes us to move eastward and drift away from God and make it all about me, 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 me. And that's what we see in this story. And that's the first lesson that we can learn about pride in this story. They drifted eastward. They thought life was all about them. They emotionally and spiritually drifted away from God and made it all about them. That's the first thing we can learn in this story about pride. But there's another thing we can learn about pride in this story, and it's also found in verse 2. Let me read that verse again. It says this, As the people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar, and they settled there. Moses, once again, wants us to see something in that verse. He wants us to see where the people settled and they settled in the plain of Shinar. Why is that a big deal? Why is Moses wanting us to see that? Why is it a big deal that they are settling down in this plain? And the answer, it's because they were, God had not told them to settle down. In fact, God had told them to fill the earth and subdue the earth. They were supposed to spread out and multiply. They were supposed to move about and enjoy all of God's creation. That's what God had instructed Adam and Eve back in Genesis chapter 2. And that's what God had instructed Noah back in Genesis chapter 9. However, despite God's command to humanity, the people didn't listen to him. They didn't disperse, and they didn't subdue the earth. Rather, they collectively gathered together, and they lived in the plains of Shinar. Do you know what this shows us? It shows us that one of pride's deceptive ways for us is to cause us to think that our ways are better than God's ways. My way is better than God's way. As Proverbs 14, 12 says, there's a way that seems right to a man. There's a way that seems right to humans, but in the end, it is a way that leads to death. You see, in our pride, in our self-exaltation, we can join Gordon Hall, like the illustration I shared at the very beginning of this sermon, and think, in fact, hey, I think I'm better than God. I think I know what's best, which means I can call my own shots for my life. I can make my own rules for my life. I can determine what is right and wrong for me. Pride says I don't need to listen to God. Why? Because I know what is best. I know what is right. I know how to live my life, and no one has the right to tell me what to do 
Not even God. But here's the problem. In our attempt to call the shots, we fail to realize two very important verses. One is found in Proverbs 16, 26 that says, Pride goes before destruction. A haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 29, 23 says, Pride brings a person low, but the lowly in spirit gain honor. Here in this story in Genesis chapter 11, pride reared its deceptive head. And it caused the people to think that they were better and they knew more than God. And so they started listening to themselves rather than their heavenly father. That's the second thing we can learn in this story about pride. The pride that is so deceptive in our lives. I think I know better than God. I think in this day, I think in this decision, I'm going to listen to me because I'm better. You see, pride begins to creep into our lives, and that's the second lesson. But there's another way that pride manifests itself here in this story, and it's found in verse 3. Look at verse 3. Here's what it says. They said to each other, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Did you know that we were, or were later told in the Bible that God had instructed his people to use stone when they built? Stone was God's choice of material. Why? Because stone is strong and stones are solid and stones can stand the test of time. However, bricks... They aren't strong, and they aren't solid as stones, and they cannot stand the test of time. Bricks don't last, but stones do. And again, what we see here is pride's foolishness. Pride's foolishness. The people here in Genesis chapter 11 thought that they they could build something great, Using their own ingenuity and using their own skill, they, that you, you see, pride thinks that we can outwit God. Pride thinks that I can outsmart God. Pride thinks that I can outmaneuver God. However, what we see throughout history that this is impossible to do. We can never outmaneuver God. We can never outwit God. And we can ever, never outsmart God. Again, in our pride. And what we see in this story, we think that God won't see. We think that God won't punish us. We think that God's patience won't run out. We think that God's love doesn't include justice. We think that we can outwit, outsmart, outmaneuver God and do what we want when we want it, how we want it. It's pride's deceitfulness. It's pride's delusion. It's the, I know what God wants but I'm going to do it my way because my way is better. And that's the third thing we can learn about pride in this story. Pride here is that we think at times we can outsmart God, we can outmaneuver God, somehow we can outdo God. However, there's another lesson that we can learn about pride in this story, and that's found in verse 4. Look at verse 4. This is what it says. It says this. Then they said, come, let us build for ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we can make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we'll be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Do you see pride in that verse? The pride comes through the word ourselves. Let me ask you, why did they build the city 
answer for themselves. Not because they wanted to use their gifts and ability for God's glory. And not because they wanted to worship God in the process. They wanted to build that city for themselves. They wanted to make a name for themselves. Let me ask you, why did they build the tower? The answer so that they could work their way up to heaven, so somehow they could become like God themselves. Do you see pride's arrogance here? Do you see Gordon Hall in this story? Do you see ourselves at times in this story? They thought that they could work their way up to heaven and in some ways become like God. God, they wanted heaven to worship them. They wanted to become great. They wanted the praise of everyone around them. They wanted to make a name for themselves so that people knew who they were. You see, there's a yearning and a desire in all of us to be recognized and praised and to achieve so that we can make a name for ourselves. However, here's the thing that we need to learn. Every tower that we build, every tower that we build in our life, whether it is the self-image around us, whether it's our career and the structure of our career and the success of our career, whether it's our marriage and the, you know, the image of a perfect marriage, or if it's our kids' performance and our achievements, any tower that we build, whatever it is, is an attempt to get something for ourselves that only God can give us. You see, pride says, I can achieve and do and be and make a name for myself. It's not that having a career is wrong or having a good marriage is wrong or being successful is wrong or being rich is wrong. None of these are wrong. Some of these and many of these are blessings from God. However, it is when we do it for ourselves and we take all of the credit for ourselves and attempt to get something for ourselves for what only God can give us. It's pride. It's pride. It's interesting that if you were to look throughout Scripture of how the Bible describes towers throughout Scripture, do you know what towers symbolize in the Bible? Pride. Isaiah 2, 12 to 17 says this, and see if you can see it. The Lord Almighty has a day in store for all of the proud and lofty, for all that is exalted, and they will be humbled. For all the cedars of Lebanon, tall and lofty, for all of the oaks of Bashan, for all of the towering mountains and all of the high hills, for every lofty tower, every fortified wall, for every trading ship and every stately vessel, the arrogance of man will be brought low and human pride humbled. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. You see, if you were to look through the Bible, you would see that towers represent pride. However, what the Bible over and over again tries to help us to see is that God is greater and more powerful than any tower or accomplishment or achievement that we could build for ourselves. And though towers may rise in our life, God can easily bring them down. And that's what we're going to see in the story. You see, these people in their pride thought that they could build something so good, so lofty, so high that they could make a name for themselves. But I want you to see what pride looks like through the heaven's eyes. Do you know how heaven sees our pride? Our puffed out chests? 
our big heads? You want to see how heaven sees our pride? Look at verse 5. Here's what it says. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the people were building. This verse is not about the smallness of God. It isn't that God is threatened by the people. Uh Uh-oh, they're getting closer to heaven. We better come down. We better stop this. It isn't, God isn't worried that they are getting close to him or becoming too much like him. This isn't about the smallness of God, but rather what this verse is telling us, it's about the foolishness of mankind. There is a humor in this verse that we ought to see, and that humor is this, in the pride of humanity, in all of their ingenuity, in all of their skill, that, and even the size of the tower that they were building, God still had to come down from heaven. This tower did reach a height, but it could not reach God. They said, look at our mighty tower. Look how good we are. Look at what we have accomplished. But God said, what tower are you talking about? I don't even see it. That, you mean that anthill down there? That little speck in the sand? Gets me wondering when I was reading this and you know writing my message, the conversation that may have happened in heaven, and it could have happened this way. God turning to the angels and said, hey angels, get over here. You got to get a load of this. Do you see what humanity is up to down there? They're building this tower and they're trying to work their way up to heaven, to which the angels peer through the sky and say, God, what tower? I I don't see a tower. To which God says, hey, let's go down. Let's go down and I will show you the tower that they think is going to reach heaven. Do you see the satire here? Do you see the irony here? Do you see the contrast here? Do you see the absurdity here? This tower in all of its greatness, in all of its glory, in all of its grandeur was just like a tiny speck to God. Such a tiny speck that God had to go down to see what in the world they were thinking that they were doing. And here's the point. You ready? The point is this. Even the most impressive achievements of man, done with a heart of pride, are pathetic, minuscule accomplishments in the eyes of God. You can have the greatest achievements and you can have the greatest accomplishments. You can be the Prime Minister of Canada. You can win a Nobel Peace Prize. You can discover the vaccine for COVID. You can build the tallest tower. You can make the most money anyone could ever have. You can be the best athlete. You can have all of the grades in all of your school. You can be the brightest, the best looking, the most accomplished. But if in all of your accomplishments, you are doing it with a heart of pride. The Lord is not even impressed. He doesn't even see it. Psalm 2, 4 says this, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Isaiah 40, says, God sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. And the people of the earth, they're like grasshoppers. John 15, 5 says, even apart, Jesus says, even apart from me, you can't do nothing. I love the conversation that God Almighty had with Job. In Job 38, let me read you portions of it. This is God's conversation with Job. You ready for it? He says, brace yourself. Like a man, Job, I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you 
When I laid the earth's foundation, who marked off all of its divisions? Who stretched a measuring line across it? Have you ever seen, give, or have you ever given orders to the morning, Joe? Or shown the dawn its place? Have you ever journeyed to the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been shown to you, Joe? Have you seen the gates of the deepest darkness? Have you comprehended the vastness or the vast expanse of the earth, Job? Tell me, if you know all of this, what is the way to the abode of the light, Job? And where does darkness reside? Surely you know, for you were already born. You have lived so many years. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow or seen the storehouses of the hail? What is the way to the place where the lightning is dispersed or the place where the east winds are scattered over the earth? Can you bring the chain or can you bind the chains of the pieties? Can you loosen Orion's belt? Can you bring forth the constellations in their seasons? Or lead out the bear with its cubs. Do you know the laws of heaven, Job? Can you set up God's dominion over the earth? Do you send the lightning bolts on their way? Do, you, do they report to you? Job, will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who accuses God answer him. In other words, God says to Job, Job, where were you? Where were you? And who do you think you are? Are you God? No, you are just a mere human being. Do you see what pride does? Pride is just a mockery of God. It's a belittling of the divine. All of our accomplishments and all of our achievements are only possible because God has given us the ability. You see, the Tower of Babel was so microscopic that the all-seeing, all-powerful God had to come down just to get a glimpse of it. It's as though God was saying, pride, you're, you're proud of that. You're proud of this accomplishment that, that I gave you the ability to do? Church, do you see it? Do you see the, how small we really are? Do you want to know how heaven sees our pride? Do you want to know how God sees our pride do you know, want to know what the smell is like? The smell is like a stench to his nostrils. In fact, this is what God says. Proverbs 8.13 says this, I hate pride. I hate arrogance. Proverbs 16.5 says, The Lord detests all of the proud of heart. Be sure of this. They will not go unpunished. Proverbs 21, 4 says a proud heart is sin. Why does God hate pride so much? Why is it such a stench to his nostrils? It's because apart from him, we can do nothing. All we have is because of him. All we have done is because of him. All we are is because of him. We are nothing without him. However, the pride of our hearts lies to us. And it puffs us up. And it even tells us that God will be impressed because what we have done. And God is trying to tell us that's not the case. That's not the case. So God does something. 
when the pride puffs up and when our head gets big and when we think we can outwit, outtrick, outsmart God and we think that we are more than what we really are, God does something. Something that we see here in this story. You want to know how God deals with our pride? It's found in verse 6. You want to know how God lovingly kills the pride in our life? You want to know how he wages war on the pride of our hearts? It's found in verse 6 and onward. This is what it says. The Lord says, if as one people speaking the same language they've begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there all over the earth and they stopped building the city. Do you know how God kills the pride inside of our hearts? You know, God wages war on the pride of our hearts. The answer? He humbles us. He humbles us. And he humbled these people here in Genesis chapter 11. He humbled them by confusing their language. He humbled them by scattering them all over the earth and doing what he had actually intended them to do. He humbled them by causing them to stop building the city and to watch that mighty tower decay. It's interesting that God did not destroy the tower. Why? I think they wanted to see, that God wanted to see them to see the erosion of that tower over time. They thought they could do something that only God could do. And that would be a constant reminder of what pride does. Church, can I lovingly and gently say this? There are moments where God will humble us by bringing us down so that we could see ourselves for who we really are and so that we could see God for who he really is. You wanna, I, want, I want you to see something here in this text. It's so interesting. Every single thing that humanity set out to do in this text became a complete and utter failure. In the pride of their heart, in the pride of their in- ingenuity, in their pride of their minds, everything came to a failure. The people had one voice, one language at the beginning of the story. However, at the end, uh, they ended with many languages. They didn't fill the earth, but rather lived together. However, at the end of the story, they ended up being dispersed throughout all of the world. They wanted to build for them a great city. However, by the end of the story, they had to leave that city unfinished. They wanted to become like God by building a tower. However, by the end of it, they got so confused and rooted by one another uh, that, uh, that they realized that there was only one God. They wanted to make a name for themselves and become great for other people to see. However, what God did at the end of this story, God allowed them not to make a name for themselves. They did make a name for themselves, but it wasn't how they wanted. They wanted the whole world to look at them and say, wow, look at your accomplishment. But the tower was standing there eroding. And so people would say, look at the tower they made. They thought they could work their way up to heaven. You see, God disrupted every single thing that humanity tried to do. You see, if pride is the root of all sins, then you know what humility is? Humility is the root of all virtue. John Owen once said these words, there are two things that are suited to be humble. 
are suited to humble the souls of men. And they are, first, a due consideration of God, and then of themselves, of God in his greatness and glory and holiness and power and majesty and authority of ourselves in our mean, object, and sinful condition. As someone once said, humility flows from the double awareness of God's glorious holiness and our spiritual poverty. When God lovingly humbles us by allowing us to realize our spiritual poverty and his glorious holiness, pride gets placed under the knife and God begins to work in our hearts. How does God deal with the pride of our life? He lovingly humbles us. He brings us low. God does, many, does this in many different ways throughout our life. How does God humble us? He may humble us because he exposes our sin. The sin our sin gets found out. God may humble us by taking things away so that we can turn to him. God humbles us by causing us to be unsatisfied with the things of this world, the things that we thought would bring us satisfaction so that we can turn to him. God humbles us by using other people to speak into our life. God could even fire us from our job. God can even... Um, uh, cause us to not make the team, to not get the grades, to not get that job. And the list could go on. God uses a countless ways to bring us low so that we fall on our face and confess our idols and turn to him. Church, you need to see this. Pride will ruin our lives. And so God in his love for you, in his love for me, in the love for this church, and love for all of humanity, comes down. And he humbles us. He wants us to recognize and kill the pride of our lives. And so God humbles us so that we can exalt and worship and turn to him. So really the question Really, the question for this morning is this. Do you see the pride in your life? Do you see maybe the areas in which pride is crept into? And are you willing to surrender them before they kill you? And when God comes tapping into your life, and when he lovingly humbles you, how are you going to respond? Are you going to say, oh God, thank you. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your humility. Because in that, I see myself for who I really am. And I could turn to you and begin to worship. So I want to encourage Tyler and the worship team to come forward. And he's going to lead us in a response this morning. Can I be honest with you? Pride is like a ninja. Pride is like a chameleon. Pride is like mold. It hides itself. And it can come out at any time to attack us. And it grows in areas of our life where we least expect it. Are you willing to be humbled by God so that you can lift up the name of God and worship him? Because what we've seen from Genesis 1 to 11 is all the way through Genesis 1 to 11, humanity thought they were better than God. Humanity thought that sin was better. And yet what we've seen all the way from 1 to 11 is that God disrupts that attitude and that heart and he humbles the people. Where's your heart this morning? How do you see the pride of your life? And how do you see God? Let me pray.
pray, and then Tyler's going to lead us. Father, my one and simple prayer this morning is this, that by your spirit who is here and who is at work, my one and only prayer for this room right now is that, Holy Spirit, you would expose the pride in our life. bring us in humility to our knees so that we can magnify you and worship you and live for you. Would you do that right now as we finish this service? And I pray these things in Christ's name. you as we respond to stand, to sit, to kneel, which can be a sign of, of humility, a posture of humility, whatever you need to do right now as we respond. We sing this together. We fall down. We lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. We fall down. We lay crowns at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of His mercy and love is at the feet of Jesus. And we cry, holy, holy, holy. Cry, holy, holy, holy. We cry, holy, holy, holy is the two weeks we were at a, at a conference and um, the speaker was talking about the glory of God and he talked about the story of Moses and he was talking about how 
Moses was saying to God, we're not going to go into the land if you don't go with us. If your glory doesn't go with us, what sets us apart from other nations? What sets us, what makes us different? And the, the story resolves with, with Moses asking God, pleading him, saying, show me your glory. And if you know the story, the Lord says, no man can see my face, but I will pass before you and you will see the, my back. And in that moment when, when the Lord passed before Moses, his face shone. And when he went down to the camp, they had to put a veil over his face. And it was a reminder to the people that the Lord was with them. And whenever they saw Moses, they didn't see Moses anymore. They saw the glory of God. And so just as we see in the story of Babel, the, Lord, the Tower of Babel, the Lord made these people low. He, hum he humbled them. And for us today, it's only at the point when we cease to look for our own glory. And we cease to, we look to point people to God's glory, look to, to reflect His holiness and His, His glorious nature. At that moment, we are made low. So I want to invite you to stand together, and we're going to declare this bridge, show us your glory, show us your power, show us your glory, Lord. This is our desire. We, want to, we don't want our own self to be glorified. We want to lift His name this morning. Sing this together. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory.
as we do that, may we fix our eyes upon Jesus. May he be enough for us. Let's just sing out this chorus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. after that, June the 4th, nine people, nine people are going to be baptized. I encourage you to be a part of that. And if you have questions that you've, you know, been wrestling through that you want to ask, we will encourage you to submit those online. There's a form online where you can always bring them to the Welcome Center. We'd love to answer those questions. God bless you. God bless you this week. May you go, may you go worshiping the name of Jesus this week and lifting him high. Lifting him high. Face down on the floor, all to echo.